Okay, so it's 1010. I'm going to start right on time every time. This is Sociology One. I am Ann Swidler. If you did not get a syllabus and you want one, uh, Cyrus Dion is standing right there and you can put a hand up and he will give it to you. I have a huge amount I want to accomplish today, so pay attention. I Pay attention involves this. So I'm, you can't really read the words because I couldn't photograph this clearly enough, but I am going to read you this cartoon. Heads up, dude, he's emailing his friend. Heads up, dude, Professor Atkins just asked you a question. Zipper, about what? No clue, just heard your name. Maybe if I ignore her, she'll think I'm taking notes. Click, click, click on his computer. She just asked your, again, man, your major greenhouse, four major greenhouse gases. Uh, stole her while I Google it, he says. <laughs> so clicky, click, click. Professor, we couldn't hear the question back here. Could you repeat it? I asked Zipper to name four major greenhouse gases. And then water vapor, CO2, ozone, and methane, he says, having Googled it. Uh, right. <laughs> you owe me one, dude, his friend says. If this keeps up, I'll never get through my email. Click, click, click. Okay, so if you take notes on your computer, that's fine with me, but I do not want you checking a website, Facebook, looking at anything else. I do not want you using your computer for any other purpose in my class. If you do, I will see it because the kid behind you will be distracted looking over your shoulder. And I will stop the class and humiliate you and ask you to leave. So don't do it. It's incredibly rude. Don't do it. Okay? Don't even think about it. Don't do it. Okay? This is an interpersonal situation. It's, believe it or not, you and I actually have now a relationship of sorts. And so I'm asking you not to do something rude. And. Uh, I, I really I also shouldn't be gossiping with your friends, uh, borrowing a piece of gum and so forth. Okay, now I'm going to give a real lecture for about 20 or 25 minutes. Then I'm going to talk about some administrative things. Then I'm going to do something extremely important, give another tiny bit of a lecture that has an in-class written assignment. So do not leave unless you're not in the course because you can't stay in the course unless you complete this assignment and it cannot be done at home. It must be done in class. So don't leave me, stay with me. Okay, now, uh, what is sociology? And uh, I have there that it is a weird field. And what I mean by that is that the sociological way of thinking about the world does not come naturally to most Americans. It is an unfamiliar, odd, different way of thinking. And even those of you who are from immigrant families will find that you increasingly, no matter what you think about yourselves, you are becoming more American by the day. Indeed, there is a lot of research showing that even those of you who are visiting from abroad will be changed by this experience. There's actually very good research on Japanese students showing that having spent time outside of Japan in Canada or the US at all changes people, changes the way they think about the self. So what is sociology? Well, you could say it is the systematic, I, this is not going to be very informative, it is the systematic study of social life or the attempt to explain the causes and consequences of social phenomena. But the reason it's a weird field is because most of us tend to think about everything that happens as being determined by our own individual traits. We think that it's how much character we have, how hard we work, how, uh, how committed we are, whether we're good people or not. And for example, we have an election coming up. And rather than people really being focused on policy or even party platforms, they are mainly concerned about whether these two people are good people. 
And in fact, the polls show that people like Obama better. He's better on the sort of relaxed, get together with people, somehow comfortable in his own skin factor. And Romney, people are afraid, is too cold. Well, in most countries in the world, actually, these features play a much smaller role. And people are much more worried about what political party people are in and how they actually would organize policy. But Americans tend to think in terms of individuals. And in fact, I see this, I like murder mysteries, so I read a lot of mystery novels. And one thing you will notice is that French murder mysteries, for example, the classic are by an author named Simonon, and the uh, chief detective is Inspector Maigret, M-A-I-G-R-E-T. And Inspector Maigret is a bureaucrat. He's actually the director of a major office of the French, the Paris police force. He's a conventional guy. He has a team of people who work for him. He has deep psychological insight into the weirdness of human personality. But he goes every home every day for lunch cooked by his wife. Drinks a little glass of brandy. She, Madame Maigret, makes a chicken for him. Something like this. The American detective would never, never, never be a bureaucrat. He would be a cop who got dismissed from the force because he was rebellious. He would be the classic American detective is a down and out detective, he works in a shabby little office, or lately she works in a shabby little office where the phone never rings, uh, barely scraping by, totally outside the rules, operates completely unconventionally. In other words, the heroes in this individualistic culture are not people who are part of a social organization, not people who are part of a system not people who are part of a social institution. They are lone rangers. They are by themselves. And you can think all the way, the Matt Damon movies, this endures right down to the present even though we don't watch westerns. It's the lone cowboy, the person who can't get along in society, who is the hero. Well, that makes it very hard within that cultural experience to think about the power of social forces. So sociology is a weird field largely because it requires you to rework your intuitions a little bit. Now, when you do that, it is enormously fun, enormously interesting, enormously revealing, but at first it does not come naturally. It will not be easy. And this leads me to say this is not an easy course. So if you started doing the readings, you already recognize that the first week's readings are very, very difficult. It's, I mean, the thing you're reading was written, uh, I think, in 1902. So the very, very beginning of the last century. It was translated not very well sometime in the 1930s or 40s. And so it's just, I, we recognize this. You have very few pages, but the pages you have are quite tough going. But it's difficult for even a deeper reason, which is that at first it will not naturally fit with your intuitions. So this leads me to say something quite important, especially to those of you who are college freshmen or transfer students for whom this is your first semester at Cal, which is do not fall behind at the beginning of your courses. And this is true not just for this course, but for every course. The, one of my lectures, my freshman year in college, someone said, keep up for the first six weeks and you will be okay. And what the person meant by that was that once you have understood the kind of thing a course is about, the readings get easier, writing the papers gets easier, everything sort of, but that if you don't get those first six weeks down where you really understand it, then trying to do it later 
You don't know what you're reading. You don't know what you're, they're talking about. You don't understand it. So in this course and in every course, you should really put other things aside. It's not the first six weeks party and then I'll uh, do some schoolwork. It's the first six weeks really work. Then you can explore more what college might have available, join a club, do political work, yes. Um, you know, join the campus newspaper, whatever your favorite activity would be. But keep up. The second thing, and this isn't just about sociology, again, the part that's about sociology is that once you get intuitively what we're doing, you can only get that by reading, by going to the lectures, by paying attention. The second thing I would urge you to do in all your classes is take notes. Don't just sit there watching. I, you might not see it right now, but some of the lectures at least will be quite entertaining. I think I'm a fun lecturer, one teaching words, blah, blah, blah. But if you think you will remember, that is incorrect. You will not remember. And if you have not processed what you heard through your own mind and written it down, it will not stay in your brain. Now, there's one other thing. This course, either this is the good news or the bad news, is being webcast. So you can actually either skip a lecture and watch it on the web. I hope not too many people will do that or the room will kind of shrink. But I'm, this is an experiment. I'll find out what it's like. I'll find out whether I'm lecturing to an empty classroom, which I would hate. And it means that you could review. But do not imagine that you are going to you know, sit there the night before the final exam and listen to 26 hours of lectures. Uh, no, it's not just that you don't have 26 hours. It's that that process of really incorporating what you've learned so that you can think with it cannot happen unless you do everything as the course is going along, especially early on. So invest your time now. Okay, now substantively. Today I'm going to talk about one of the great sociologists, the person you're reading this week, Emile Durkheim, and his classic book, Suicide. So Durkheim wrote three great books and many, many other important books and many, many hundreds of articles. But the one that, well, there are several, but the one that sociologists go back to again and again and again is this one, Suicide. I used to assign it and I had all these students walking around campus with a red book that said suicide and people would be stopping them and saying, oh no, don't, don't. <laughs> Things will get better, don't worry. Um, so it's not a how-to book. Um, it is one of the most brilliant demonstrations of the relationship between individual life and social life ever created. And Durkheim's fundamental insight was that what seems like the most individual act a person could commit, the loneliest, saddest, most individual possible action is actually profoundly social in its causes. And I would say that even though the language he uses is very old fashioned, he has a few observations, particularly about women, that are completely out of sync with what modern people believe. Nonetheless, his insights into the social causes of suicide have held up. They're basically still the basis on which this sort of analysis is done. Okay, what was his insight? Well, he starts from paying attention not to individuals who commit suicide, but to how suicide rates differ between groups, right? So he's interested in what he calls the propensity, the likelihood, the sort of statistical differences between one group and another in their likelihood of committing suicide. He analyzed huge amounts of data from Europe in the 19th century, and one of the funny little footnotes here is that um, he actually had his son-in-law, also a great sociologist, Marcel Mauss, M-A-U-S-S, uh, hand code 30,000 suicide records. So uh, I don't know what, you know, he, if he had to do that in order to earn the daughter or if he just uh, 
maybe he obeyed everything Durkheim told him, and Durkheim said, analyze 30,000 suicides, marry my daughter, uh, come with me to class, and he just said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. We don't actually know how that happened. But in any case, Durkheim's first insight was, or his first analysis, and this is what you're reading this week, is that he noticed that Protestants were substantially less likely to commit suicide than either Catholics or Jews. So there was variation by religious group. And this was true across different countries in Europe. And he asked, why would that be? What, what is it about Protestantism that puts people at greater risk of suicide? And his argument is one that sounds strange to us now. He argued that what Protestantism did was tell people to rely more on their own judgment, their own conscience, their own reading of the Bible. So Protestants, he argued, were vulnerable to suicide because they were, in some odd way, too reliant on their own judgment. Right? So relying on your own judgment put you at risk. And in the 19th century, both the Catholic Church and ghettoized Jewish communities had religious authorities, the pope and the priest or the rabbi, who told you how to behave, what to believe, what to do. Now, this is not true of either of these movements in the 20th century to the same extent. But in the 19th century, it was Protestants who made up their own minds about more religious issues. And Jews and Catholics were more subject to authority. And being subject to that authority was somehow protective. Now, why would it be protective against suicide? Doesn't, we're not talking about making you a happier person. Just protective against suicide to be told what to think and make you vulnerable to suicide, to exercise your own judgment. And Durkheim developed this category of egoistic suicide to explain suicides of this type. And what is the problem with egoistic suicide? What is it the problem with Protestantism in Durkheim's understanding? For Durkheim, the problem is that if you have to answer the question, what should I live for? You're feeling bad, you're feeling depressed, and you ask, what should I live for? If the answer to that question is, well, me, my rationality, my understanding of the world, my judgment, my freedom, my, and you are, you don't like yourself. That day you hate yourself. Then the answer to the question of what you should live for is there's really not much outside yourself that matters. And so there isn't a reason to live, right? And being told by other people, by your community, by an authority, what's true, what's real, what matters, means you have something outside of yourself to live for. And Durkheim was saying that what protects people against egoistic suicide is that they have something outside themselves, greater than themselves, that provides meaning and purpose. It's the answer to the question, what do I have to live for? Now, Durkheim further pursued this and kind of tried to prove that egoistic suicide really was a social cause, that there really were social causes that created this sort of suicide by looking at the difference between married and single people. And he showed that married people are considerably protected against suicide. He did all, even though he had almost, he didn't have computers, needless to say, maybe that's not obvious, obvious to me. These were all hand calculations. They didn't even have calculators. So, I mean, they may have had mechanical ones or an abacus or something. But this is really hard work to do this. 
He showed that married people are protected against suicide compared to single people. This is still true. Being married is hugely protective for your health in a whole variety of ways. Well, you might say, okay, but married people are happier. You know, they have companionship, they have... Well, what he showed that's so brilliant is that even widows and widowers are protected against suicide compared to single people. Especially, he showed, if they have children. So the burdens are terrible. You're a young wife, your husband dies. In the 19th century, you would have had almost no way to support yourself. Why would that be protective against suicide? I would assume you're miserable, even compared to a single person. But think about it. Egoistic suicide is the kind where you have nothing to live for outside of yourself. And if you're a widowed parent with children, you have to keep going. You have to keep going for your children. So doing things only for yourself actually is dangerous. And having to do things for someone else. So I make this joke that um, parents of young children not only can't commit suicide, they can't even get sick for a day. Because, because they have to get up in the morning, they have to change the baby's diaper, they have to feed their kids, they have to drag themselves up. They just can't not function. They have to function. Yes? Uh, because I, why do widowers and widowers, the protective effect is less for them, but even widows and widowers without children, I think Durkheim believes, and this will get us into next lecture, but it's a very good question, have been incorporated into a little society that's larger than themselves, and that is the marriage and the family they're now part of. And so even if the spouse is dead, they still are part of a social entity greater than themselves. So you can then sort of turn this around and say, if egoistic suicide is the, suicide, the suicide of meaninglessness, and by that I just mean not having something greater than yourself that matters, that's worth living for. Okay. The second type, major type of suicide Durkheim discusses, and there are not one but two more types besides these that I'm not going to tell you about that you can learn about only in section, so you must do your reading and go to section, um, is what he called anomic suicide. And I'm sorry to say you have to just write down the word anomic and memorize it. It's from a French word, anomie. You might have heard people use it to mean kind of alienation, like, oh, it's a very anomic situation, everybody's miserable, nobody's really talking to each other. It means kind of the breakdown of social ties, something like that. It literally means loss of rules. So the word nomia is the word for rules or laws. So it means kind of without rules. That's the literal meaning. Again, we use it to mean kind of lonely and out of it, but it, it's technically it means without rules. And anomic suicide, Durkheim argued, was quite different than egoistic suicide. Anomic suicide tended to exist in periods when there was very rapid social change. So it's essentially the suicide of rapid social transformation. And if any of you come from societies that went through very, very rapid economic growth, you will know that, in fact, very traditional societies where people are very, very, very poor, suicides are incredibly rare. Incredibly rare. India before the modern period, Asia before, very, very rare. But suicide increases rapidly with modernity. And the anomic form of suicide for Durkheim is the suicide where you no longer know where, what the rules are or the rules break down. And I'm going to try to explain intuitively why that's so important. But first, his first example was that in periods of very rapid economic growth and in periods of depression, like the Great Depression, so suddenly your business collapses, well, that's quite understandable that you might. And there were, during the US in the Great Depression, there were a lot of suicides. 
Um, I don't know how many of you remember the Madoff scandal, but the son of Madoff, you know, he killed himself a couple of years ago. And you could say, well, his whole world had collapsed around him. You know, very understandable. But why would people also commit suicide when things are getting better rapidly? And Durkheim really saw anonic suicide. I've used the term here, the suicide of frustration. But another way to think about it, it's the suicide people uh, are tempted to, I'll put that it that way, uh, when there are no limits to their aspirations. So he, his insight is that most of us, most of the time, judge whether we're doing the right thing, whether we've behaved appropriately, whether we've achieved enough by the rules of our subgroup. So you're in high school, you know what it is to be a cool kid or a nerdy kid or an academically successful kid, which I hope all of you, and some of you might not be kids, some of you might be real grown-ups, but you know what it is to be an academically successful person. You come to college and suddenly you're in a new world. You don't know what's accept, expected of you. You don't know how you're supposed to behave. You don't know what's appropriate. I, I used this example with my teaching assistants yesterday, and they might have already used it or use it again in section. But one of the huge things, are you going to embarrass yourself in every imaginable way? Wearing the wrong clothes the first day of school, not knowing how to greet people, are you, if you come to see me, which I hope you will, what will you call me? Will you walk out of the office saying, oh my gosh, I think I called her Anne, oh my, and then just spend hours staring at the ceiling thinking, what have I done, what have I done, what have I done? Will you call me Professor Swidler and say, gosh, that sounded so formal, I don't know if she thinks that's the right thing. Should I call her? I actually had a professor who I couldn't bear to call by his first name. His name was Leo Lowenthal. And after I passed my oral exams, he said, he was European born, he said, Anne, you can no longer call me Professor Lowenthal. And I said, okay, Professor Leo. <laughs> and so I just couldn't, couldn't bring myself. Okay, but when you don't know what the rules are anymore, because suddenly the rules have changed, you're in a lot greater danger of making a lot more mistakes and feeling a lot more awkward and uncomfortable and bad about yourself. So that's just one obvious thing, that if the rules suddenly change on you. But Durkheim is thinking of this in a deeper sense. And maybe I can explain this better with the following. So again, I'm going to assume most of you are freshmen, but even those who aren't, um, I'm going to assume you were pretty good students in high school. And when you get to Berkeley, uh, what would be a good performance here? What would you feel good about? What would make you feel good about yourself? What's really worth doing here? And let me tell you, I know there are a certain number of you who just want an A, and you want an A in every class, and you're desperate for that A. And so let's imagine, miracle of miracles, you actually get those A's. <laughs> and you end up with a 4.0 your freshman year. And then I'm going to ask you, is that really important? Do you know the names of all the people who had 4.0s last year? They're written down somewhere. They're carved in stone. They're you know, incredibly, no. Well, what if you didn't, what if you actually had the best GPA or whatever? They, I'm sure that doesn't, isn't how it's done. But you actually were the valedictorian at Berkeley. Yeah, okay. Can you name last year's valedictorian? Or the one from 1957 or from 1968 or from 1974 or from 1994, or from 2003, or from 2012? Anybody? 
Okay, so I'm just going to say basically, who cares? It's not, I mean, these things, there really is no accomplishment that is so important that if you do that, it's enough. You have done it. You have, even if you become a scientist and you develop some wonderful new molecule that improves the survival of a certain kind of cancer, there are millions of people dying all over the world whom you haven't helped a bit. Your little accomplishment, just objectively speaking, doesn't amount to much. Take me. Well, I go to cocktail parties. People say, oh, what do you do? I say, mm, uh, I'm a sociologist. And they say, ooh, uh, John, what, what, <laughs> you know, I mean, really? I'm going to make cocktail party chatter out of being a sociologist? And I'll confess something incredibly embarrassing, which is for me, publishing an article in the American Sociological Review or, which I have never done, the American Journal of Sociology is like, oh my God, the be-all and end-all. And for you guys, it's a joke. I mean, you wouldn't give up, you know, next Saturday afternoon for an hour to be able, because what does it matter? In the big scheme of things, all the things we think are so important don't matter a bit. <laughs> That's the actual truth. That's the objective truth. And what Durkheim is saying is you don't live in the objective truth. You live in social truth. And for social truth, it's incredibly important that you do okay at college. And if for your parents just to survive your freshman year and not get thrown out is a huge victory, that's a real victory. But it's not objectively a victory. It's a victory because somebody, your family, defines what's important. They define when you've done enough. And if you're the first person in your college ever to go, or your first person in your family ever to go to college, then getting here was a huge achievement. Not because objectively it matters and is going to change human history, but because you live in a social world that defines what is enough. It defines what are appropriate aspirations, and it limits those levels to some meaningful standard that's meaningful in your world. So for me, in sociology, because I am a part of a discipline that values research and publication, it's incredibly important, but it's, and I have devoted my life to it, not just an hour here and an hour there. Whatever meaning my life has is my life as a parent, my life as a wife, and my life as a scholar. But it's not, other people would just think, they're, they're not part of that social world. So it's social worlds that create our limits and that define our aspirations. And this is what Durkheim called regulation. He argued that the social rules we live in regulate our aspirations and tell us when we have done enough. So you can think of anomic suicide as when the rules break down and you no longer have a definition of when you have done enough, then you are really in trouble. And I hope you'll talk in section about celebrities. This is a huge, fascinating thing. These people achieve what you have wanted to achieve. They're superstars. Everybody worships them. They walk down the street and people take pictures of them. They produce, you know, records and concerts that earn millions and millions and millions of dollars. They are superstar athletes that anybody who's in sports would give, you know, anything to be like them. And their levels of self-destructive behavior are absolutely astounding. <laughs> they destroy themselves at a rate that is just, and it's because they have no limits. So I'm going to ask you to think in section 
about what it means to have no limits on your aspirations, no limits on your behavior. Okay, now I'm going to take a break. Do not go anywhere. I want the GSIs to start handing out one of these to each of you, and you are going to have to write something. So I want you to pay attention while I talk to you. So don't, don't pay attention to anything but me, except get a sheet, and then I will tell you what to do. But first, I'm going to talk about a few details of the course, and then I'm going to tell you what you're going to do with this sheet. So, shh, quiet. No talk, no talk. OK, because, all right, so first, grading in the course. The basic system is 10% for the midterm. And this will be on the PowerPoint. You don't have to worry about it. 30% for the final exam. So there are two in-class exams, 20% for each of the two papers, and 20% for section participation. I want to highlight this last point, which is that all grading is on a 0 to 100 scale. So not doing something will destroy your grade. Basically, if you fail to do any of those things, if you blow off section and get a 0, you will fail the course. It just, it's, I mean, it takes 20 points off the top of your grade. So conceivably, if you did everything perfectly, you could get an 80, which is the lowest imaginable B minus. But it just, it does not pay to skip anything. So that's the basic point. The second thing is, what is the standard? And I want to uh, just say, I want you to do the reading, to attend and pay attention in lectures, not be asleep, not stare off into space, but try to pay attention. Go to section. If you really do all the work in the course, if you really do all the work in the course, so it's not, we're not giving out the, yeah, it's the one page sheet that they need. Yeah. If you really do all the work in the course, I hope you would get at least a B. If you do all the work in the course well, you'll get some kind of A. And if you mess up and you don't do it, those are the people who get the C's, D's, and F's. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I am basically an easy grader. I want you to do well. If everybody does great work, they can all have A's and A minuses or whatever. But if you do not do the work, and it's a hard course, it has a lot of work, I will fail you. And there are plenty of F's in this course every year because people basically blow off the work. They don't do it. And I mean they don't do it, and I won't have it. So if you're not going to do the work in the course, don't take the course. It's not a gut. It's not an easy course. It's a course for people who ideally want to be sociology majors. We put a huge amount of resources into the course, and I want you to do it. OK, now, this assignment has two parts. One is that one theme of the course is going to be about institutions. We are going to read about institutions all next week. Here I am giving you a quick and dirty understanding which is most sociology textbooks, let's say, will tell you a little bit about, you know, sociology has culture and so on and so forth. And then they will run you through the basic institutions of a modern society. So there will be a chapter on sociology of education. And education is an institution. There will be sociology of law, sociology of the family, sociology of religion, sociology of politics, sociology of uh, there's now a field economic sociology. So the basic institutions of a modern society are things like the legal order, the family, religion, the economy, government. That's really what sociologists mean by institutions. But I want to give you a little deeper sense that what it means to be a person is very much anchored in your connection to an institution. And that institutions aren't just what I have here, which is a pattern of expected action of individuals or groups enforced by social sanctions, which means rewards and punishments. And that is just, that's going to be in your reading next week, that exact quote. So you don't have to worry about it terribly much. But I'm trying to get the idea that when something is an institution, first, it's lasting. So the wonderful question this person here asked about why widows and widowers are still protected. And I kind of said, well, they're part of a little society that lasts beyond them. 
Well, you might say one thing is they've become part of the institution of marriage, right? So their individual marriage has broken down because somebody died, but they have participated in the institution of marriage which existed before them and will endure after them, right? And so one part of institutions is that they are reproduced even when the participants come and go. The second thing about institutions is that they have a kind of, because there are rules, let's say, there are rules and there are rewards for obeying the rules and punishments for not obeying the rules, um, they tend to help you know what to do with yourself. And they also provide um, a sense of identity. So the role of, if somebody asks you, oh, what do you do? You will say, I'm a student or I'm a student at Berkeley. And that is understood to be a role that has some meaning. You are a son or daughter in a family. You are a member of maybe a religious institution. So without going into this, I'll just say institutions are patterns that are reproduced and endure. There is some kind of rule that defines the pattern. There are sanctions that enforce the pattern and there are purposes and meaning. So for every important institution, you can say, why does it exist? Why does the university as an institution exist? Well, it exists to produce new knowledge and to educate and transmit, to educate new generations of people and to transmit that knowledge. That's what they exist for. So now I want you to write on that sheet of paper I handed out, a brief, very brief, it can be just two or three lines, I want you to name one institution, the family, education, religion, law, that matters to you, and I want you to say something about your own position in it, your role, as it were. So, and I'm going to leave this for next week, but I think this is, and again, it doesn't have to be good. Oh, you also need to put the name of your GSI or your section number. So if you're filling out this, I have the list of all the section and who the GSIs are. And so you should know your, the easiest is if you just know your section number, that's fine. If you're going to change section or try to change, that's fine. Put your current section, okay? And it's really important to me. I don't want anybody, everybody who takes the course, if you have not done this, if you have not written this one page, you can't stay in the course, so you might as well do it. Because the other thing I'm going to talk to you about while you're writing is plagiarism. So I don't know if everybody here is an English speaker. It's a funny word. Uh, you don't have to know how to spell it, but you have to know that it's incredibly important. And that the institution of the university is about helping you develop your skills acquire knowledge, and become, in many, many ways, a better thinker, a better citizen, a better person. And we cannot do this. We invest enormous time and energy in helping you improve your work. If you turn in work to us that is not your work, we are enraged. So there are many parts of social life where it's fine to copy. If I go to my synagogue and I say the same prayers people have said for thousands of years, it's totally fine. I'm not supposed to make up my own prayers. I'm supposed to use exactly the ones that have always been there. There are many other situations where if you go home and tell your friends everything you learned in class, I'm thrilled. I don't want copyright. I want everybody in the world to share my wonderful ideas. No, but I do not want you to copy anything not for, if you copy from the web, we will find it. I guarantee it. If you borrow a paper from somebody else, from your fraternity or sorority, this incenses, I love, I go to sorority dinners, I love the Greek system, but the one thing I hate is that they keep files of old papers. I don't get the papers out. I mean, you have to come get your paper for me or give me an envelope because I'm not leaving it around for somebody to collect and, and we will catch it and we will try to get you thrown out of the university. So just let me tell you, however embarrassing you think your English is, how you can be illiterate and we will work with you. But if you try to fake work that is not yours, 
If you copy a paper, buy a paper, borrow a paper, copy a paragraph from somewhere. So we don't expect you to have all your own ideas. The whole point is to teach you ideas, for you to learn ideas. The ideas don't come out of your head, they come from elsewhere. Of course, you're going to put in your paper ideas that you got from your reading. If you quote something, fine, put quotation marks around it, tell us where you got it. I don't care much about footnote format. You can use any, just give us the title of the book and the page number. Fine. I'm not worried about that. You know what copying is. You know what it is to lift things off the internet. I read the papers. I know this has become incredibly common in American high schools. And it is not going to happen here. And again, if it does happen, it creates huge amounts of paperwork for us. Because I have to take you to the dean's office. I have to fill out a whole complicated form about what the punishment is. I will fail your assignment. And I will fail you for the course. And I will do everything in my power to get you thrown out. So just don't do it, okay? And there's a reason, which is that the university is a place that's about helping you improve your skills, about teaching you. And we cannot teach you if we do not know how you write, the mistakes you make. Those mistakes are precious to us. We love your mistakes, right? A perfect paper that someone else wrote is useless. A paper full of errors that you made because you actually don't understand something is great because then we can help you understand. So there is a real reason. It's not some, I don't make money out of copyright law or anything. These are the institutional purposes. In my role as a professor, I'm just telling you, this is one of the greatest academic crimes. Professors get fired from their jobs if they do it. It is just unacceptable. So I want you now to write in your own words, it can be as simple as you want, your understanding of plagiarism. And I want you to promise that you won't do it in your own words, and I want you to sign the bottom of that page. And you cannot take my class unless you do that. So you've got two minutes, and go for it. And then you can hand all those things in to me, and I won't yell at you anymore. I promise. Huh? Oh, yes. Right. Can I give you back the section numbers? Yeah, I spent a lot of time actually trying to fit everything on the slide. It was a little tricky. And then while you're doing that, I will say a couple of, I've told you none of the practical things I meant to tell you. So shh, don't talk. The reader is going to be available by tomorrow morning, for those of you who want it. This week's readings are on B-Space. If you are not in the course and after this you still want to join, no. Uh, the only way to be in the course or to change sections is to attend a section and have the GSI tell you there is room and then the GSI will tell me. That's true for concurrent enrollment students. That's true for people who aren't in the course at all. And that's true for people who, uh, if you want to get on B space, I can email me and I can put you in as a student or a guest or something. Um, yeah. Okay, so finish filling out. I, I need you to tell me what plagiarism is and that you're not going to do it. Yes. You forgot which section? Yeah. And the time and the, you don't know the time and you don't know the number or anything? Well, just say, forgot which section and we'll look you up. Okay. Okay, and then when you're done, bring me your sheets or give them to one of the GSIs. Thank you so much.